In this episode, how slavery drove the growth of our nation. Now, some people ask, why talk about slavery so much? Why center it in American history? Aren't there other stories? And doesn't it just bring up old wounds that don't serve other than to make people feel bad? And those are all great questions. The answer to all of them begins with having a love for this country and all of its people and all of its problems and being invested in its growth and its healing and its future success. The founding of the nation, the writing of our constitution had as its central conflict the issue of slavery. During each and every decade thereafter, the map of the country, its borders, its shape, its society, its economy, every aspect of it has been determined by the territorial expansion of slavers and the fights against them by non-slavers for both moral and selfish reasons. The story of slavery is the central plot of American history. Along with the driving of the natives off the land, many of whom still call Turtle Island, claiming it, renaming it America, a Latinized feminine version of an Italian name, given to it by a German map maker after a Portuguese explorer landed on the shores of Brazil. Our history is complex, multi-layered, and filled with contradictions and battles waged by champions and role models of such heroism it's hard to fathom. There are so many stories which take place outside the topic of slavery, but they also take place within the context of that central plot. Aside from American history, the story of slavery is also fundamental to all of human history, period. It's been a practice in every society in all four corners of the globe. Valuing profits, power, land, wealth over people, that's the central conflict of the story of life on Earth. In ancient times, this story was often described in metaphor. The biblical stories called greed the devil and used the name mammon. Mammon is a Latin word for material wealth. Particularly, it describes the debasing influence of material wealth. The term was used by Jesus in his famous Sermon on the Mount and the famous line in Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And for those who don't like the word God, it can be translated as we cannot serve humanity and materialism, we must choose. Slavery is an ultimate form of materialism. It's the extreme end of treating people like material objects. Every aspect of American history is inextricably intertwined in slavery. The country was founded right smack in the middle of a global slavery abolition movement. During the apex of the transatlantic slave trade, the largest maritime migration in recorded history. The central and most divisive issue and argument at the U.S. Constitutional Convention was slavery. And by allowing it to continue, the issue did not somehow magically taper out and fade away. It kept growing. In fact, it drove the expansion of U.S. territory, over doubling the size of the nation. And a few decades later, 1819, the Congress was bitterly divided over whether the new state of Missouri would be a free state or a slave state. That's the so-called Missouri Compromise, which ended up admitting Missouri as a slave state, adding Maine as a non-slave state. This compromise resolved very little. Founding father John Quincy Adams wrote in his diary at the time, quote, take it for granted that the present is a mere preamble, a title page to a great tragic volume, end quote. The country didn't even make it 85 years before turning on itself, erupting into a civil war, a violent sectional conflict between the North and the South, and the conflict never stopped. The driving justification for racial slavery was not resolved during the Reconstruction period. It was allowed to fester and morph into other forms of racial segregation, 
The purpose of revisiting slavery is not to bash America, whatever one thinks that means, or to feel badly about it, but to face it, to understand it, to atone for it, and to heal it. Until then, we find ourselves in a highly segregated country, in a cold culture war, along very similar geographic lines to the sectarian divisions we started with. And part of the fallout of that cold culture war is this almost complete eradication of the central defining aspect of American history, which is slavery. By ignoring or avoiding it, we distance ourselves from reality, from each other. We hold ourselves back from healing and unifying and making progress as one human family. That holds our nation back, no doubt about it. And as an economic world leader, our lack of historical literacy holds the planet back. So we have a political objective in talking about slavery. On an individual level, having a deep and compassionate understanding of each other in this melting pot of a nation gives us a personal objective as well, which is providing us a feeling of oneness and understanding with all humankind. What we model in ourselves, we most certainly can share with our children and with each other. That's probably the best way to do it. I once heard a wise person say, your job is not to change the world, but to graduate it. Well, I would add to that, that if we are able to graduate the feelings of separation in our hearts, we can certainly move the world in that direction as well, because the separation is an illusion anyway. So to that end, a moment's review of the transatlantic slave trade. According to the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, it's estimated that from approximately 1526 to 1867, some 12 and a half million captured men, women, and children were put on ships in Africa, and 10.7 million arrived in the Americas. The Atlantic slave trade was likely the most costly in human life of all long-distance global migration in recorded history. The number of people carried off from Africa reached 30,000 per year in the 1690s, and 85,000 per year a century later. The decade 1821 to 1830 saw more than 80,000 people a year leaving Africa in slave ships. So we see it just growing and growing and growing. Eric Foner, professor of history at Columbia University, is one of America's most prominent historians, focusing on the intersections of intellectual and political and social history and the history of American race relations. There's a PBS interview where he summarizes the period this way, saying, quote, slavery was intimately related to the major trends and developments that we associate with American history. For example, territorial expansion, the country growing more than twice its size, the Western movement, the frontier. The country grew tremendously in this period, geographically. By the 1840s, it reached the Pacific Ocean. Frederick Jackson Turner, the great historian of the late 19th century, said it was on the frontier that democracy was born, that American ideas of equality were born, individualism. But the frontier also carried with it the expansion of slavery. The westward expansion of slavery was one of the most dynamic economic and social processes going on in this century. The westward expansion carried slavery down to the southwest, into Mississippi, into Alabama, crossing the Mississippi River into Louisiana. And finally, by the 1840s, it was pouring into Texas. So the expansion of slavery, which became the major political question of the 1850s, was not just a political issue. It was a fact of life every American had experienced during this period. Americans in the 19th century through the 1800s thought of or spoke of their country as in Jefferson's phrase, an empire of liberty. And the history of the United States was conceived as a part of the progress of mankind and the spread of liberty throughout the world. And you can see this in graphic illustrations of the period of liberty leading people westward. And progress was the essence of the American story. Now in the South, Southern slave owners insisted that slavery was absolutely essential to that story of progress. 
Without slavery, you could not have civilization, they said. Slavery freed the upper class from the need to do manual labor, to worry about economic day-to-day realities, and therefore gave them the time and the intellectual ability to devote themselves to the arts and literature and mechanical advantages and inventions of all kinds, so that it was slavery itself which made the progress of civilization possible. End quote. Now, I want to include another excerpt from this PBS resource bank because it talks about Kansas in the pre-Civil War period. And this is something that too rarely gets discussed. That the Civil War did not start, as many people think, at 4.30 a.m. on April 12th, 1861, when Confederate troops fired on Fort Sumter and South Carolina's Charleston Harbor. It was already underway in the question of Kansas. The question of adding territory to the Union in the form of new states. There was a question as to whether or not it would be free states or slave states. For some, it was a question of morality. For others, it was cold economics. James Horton, professor of American studies and history at George Washington University, describes it this way in the 1700s and the 1800s. Quote, opportunity meant land. For a white worker in New York City or Philadelphia, the possibility of being able to move to the West and be an independent landowner was very, very important. And so one of the things you wanted to make sure is there'd be enough land available. You didn't want that land taken up by slaveholders and slaves. You didn't want that land taken up by even free blacks. Kansas is an important staging ground for what some people argue are the first battles of the Civil War, because it is this battlefield on which the forces of anti-slavery and the forces of slavery meet. The squatters' sovereignty policy, which is advocated by Stephen Douglas, pausing for context, Stephen Douglas was a judge, a representative of Illinois, and he's famous for the Lincoln-Douglas debates when he ran for Illinois senator in 1858. Charles Sumner, the radical Republican senator from Massachusetts and staunch abolitionist, who's famous for being caned, called Douglas a noisome, squat, and nameless animal, not a proper model for an American senator. Although it is deeply disturbing, it's instructive to recognize the nature of those debates. So before we continue, here's an excerpt from one of Abraham Lincoln's speeches during those debates. This is only 164 years ago. Abraham Lincoln, quote, equal justice to the South, it is said, requires us to consent to the extending of slavery to new countries. That is to say, inasmuch as you do not object to my taking my hog to Nebraska, therefore I must not object to you taking your slave. Now, I admit this is perfectly logical if there is no difference between hogs and Negroes. But while you thus require me to deny the humanity of the Negro, I wish to ask whether you of the South yourselves have ever been willing to do as much. Lincoln goes on to say, quote, When the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is despotism. If the Negro is a man, Why then, my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal, and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. Judge Douglas frequently, with bitter irony and sarcasm, paraphrases our argument by saying, the white people of Nebraska are good enough to govern themselves, but they are not good enough to govern a few miserable Negroes. End quote. And then Lincoln goes on. Well, I doubt not that the people of Nebraska are and will continue to be as good as the average of people elsewhere. I do not say the contrary. What I do say is that no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent." End quote. This is the discussion 164 years ago, whether or not the black man is a man, and no mention of black women at all. For more context here, the Mexican War between 1846 to 1848 has added new territories to the United States, raising the issue of slavery again. The Compromise of 1850 was another temporary salve. It called for the admission of California to the Union as a free state, 
provided a territorial government for Utah and New Mexico, established a border around Texas, and marked areas where slavery could continue. It called for the abolition of the slave trade in Washington, D.C., and amended the Fugitive Slave Act, requiring the U.S. government actively assist slavers in recapturing Americans who'd escaped. Well, that would meet fierce opposition in the North. And then there's the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. This is a measure Douglas sponsored that repealed the Missouri Compromise, lifting the ban against slavery. And in exchange, Douglas offered popular sovereignty, the doctrine that the actual settlers in the territories and not Congress could decide the fate of slavery in their midst. This is the whole free state philosophy. Meanwhile, Harriet Tubman is going back and forth into Maryland, risking her life over and over again, leading 50, 60, 70 families, men, women, children to freedom. So now going back to Professor James Horton, and he explains this squatter's sovereignty policy, which, quote, is a policy that says, we'll decide whether Kansas is going to be slave or free when the people who settle in Kansas vote on this question. And then it becomes very important as to who settles in Kansas. And so for Missouri, the pro-slavery element are trying to get settlers in who are favoring slavery and get them moving into Kansas. And meanwhile, from New York and New England, the anti-slavery element is trying to get people who favor anti-slavery to move into Kansas. Literally, the forces of slavery and anti-slavery meet in Kansas. And as a result, 1854, 55, 56, we have what is called Bleeding Kansas, and that is the Civil War, the war between slavers and anti-slavers in the Kansas Territory. This is five years before the National Civil War breaks out. And Professor Horton goes on to say, quote, you do not necessarily have to want to see black people in Kansas in order for you to be opposed to the coming of slavery in Kansas. In fact, many of the Midwestern states there were real and important restrictions against the movement of free blacks into those states. Indiana outlawed free blacks in the state entirely. Ohio had very strong restrictions against free blacks moving into the state. And I think that a lot of what this question embodies is the notion of the future of America. Is the future of America going to be America as a white man's country or America as a country in which there are multiple races? And one of the ways you can ensure that America is in the future a white man's country, and everybody understood that the future of America was in the West, that you wanted to make sure that the West was as white as possible, as free as possible from blacks, whether these blacks were slave or whether these blacks were free. So that the free soil movement, that is the movement that the Republican Party ran its campaigns based on, Part of that platform was that of free soil, meant not only keeping the territories free from slavery, but the maintaining of those territories for free white labor. End quote. So this is the context in which the United States learns of the caning of Charles Sumner on May 22, 1856. In the Senate, when Preston Brooks, a pro-slavery representative from South Carolina, a barbarian, used his cane to assault Senator Charles Sumner, an abolitionist Republican from Massachusetts, after giving a speech called The Crime Against Kansas. Now, the caning of Charles Sumner has long been considered a symbolic moment in the breakdown of reasoned discourse that eventually escalates into the Civil War. Senator Sumner's speech was intended to address this explosive issue of whether or not Kansas should be admitted into the Union as a slave or a free state. Charles Sumner, who was a proper abolitionist, says the following, quote, It belongs to me now, in the first place, to expose the crime against Kansas in its origin and extent. I say crime and deliberately adopt this strongest term, as better than any other, denoting the consummate transgression. I would go further if language could further go. And then Sumner talks about the Missouri Compromise, the lack of morality in the slave states. And he says Washington, Jefferson, and Franklin would never have been nominated to any public positions in the first place were the slavers in control of the destiny of the nation, which they, to a great extent, were. Quote, Attention from all sides was directed upon Kansas, which at once became the favorite goal of emigration 
The bill had loudly declared that its object was, quote, to leave the people perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, end quote. And its supporters everywhere challenged the determination of the question between freedom and slavery by a competition of emigration. The populist North, stung by a sharp sense of outrage and inspired by a noble cause, poured into the debatable land and promised soon to establish a supremacy of numbers there, involving, of course, a just supremacy of freedom. Then was conceived the consummation of the crime against Kansas. What could not be accomplished peaceably was to be accomplished forcibly. The reptile monster that could not be quietly and securely hatched there was to be pushed full-grown into the territory. All efforts were now given to the dismal work of forcing slavery on free soil. End quote. A few months after the caning of Charles Sumner, which nearly killed him, the Christian abolitionist John Brown took up arms against slavers in Kansas. He dragged five slavery supporters from their homes along the Potawatomi Creek, and then he butchered them with a broadsword, an Old Testament-style retribution. His intention was to strike terror into the hearts of the slavers. The Potawatomi Massacre turned Kansas into bleeding Kansas. This was the landscape of a country preceding the Civil War and the technological revolution, culminating in a new wave of globalization, most significantly electric power, the automobile, and the telephones. And this is the context in which humanity begins living in circumstances that we'd call modern life from a technological standpoint. But we do this without addressing the physical, the emotional, the psychological or economic impacts of slavery, or the type of materialistic greed that leads to slavery. The Northern radical Republicans wanted armed troops in the South to enforce voting rights for freed black Americans. American founding mothers and fathers of human rights like Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, they were calling for reparations, for land grants. All of these efforts failed against the former Confederates who created new laws and new ways to discriminate and disenfranchise and segregate, keeping black Americans from having any stakeholder position in the American experiment. And so in the aftermath of the Civil War, after approximately 640,000 Americans have died, the impact of slavery is never addressed. And in fact, it's extended. With human rights leaders fighting inch by inch for the next 100 years until Martin Luther King finally wins a Voting Rights Act. The country as a whole is as yet unable to address the impact on white Americans as well particularly Southern whites, who are almost instantly pummeled with a distorted retelling of the Civil War under this banner of the so-called lost cause myths, which pretend slavery was not the cause of the war, or that slavery was even a benevolent act rather than abject cruelty, which in turn elevates and magnifies a culture of cruelty, as even at times religiously justified. Dr. Henry Louis Gates, he has a guest essay in a recent edition of the New York Times, and it's called Who's Afraid of Black History? And therein, he talks about the historian general of the Daughters of the American Confederacy, who once, quote, insisted that librarians should scrawl unjust to the South on the title pages of any unacceptable books. And they made it easy for, quote, all authorities charged with the selection of textbooks for colleges, schools, and all scholastic institutions to, quote, accord full justice to the South, end quote. The Daughters of the Confederacy had a handy list, which included the following, quote, reject a book that speaks of the Constitution other than a compact between sovereign states. Reject a book that calls the Confederate soldier a traitor. Reject a book that says the South fought to hold her slaves. 
reject a book that speaks of the slaveholder of the South as cruel and unjust to his slaves, and Dr. Gates' favorite, reject a textbook that glorified Abraham Lincoln and vilifies Jefferson Davis. And that slavery was, quote, an education that taught the Negro self-control, obedience, and perseverance, taught him to realize his weaknesses and how to grow stronger for the battle of life, end quote. The historian general of the Confederacy, she wrote that in 1923 in a pamphlet called The South Must Have Her Rightful Place, end quote. Dr. Gates goes on in his essay to say that, quote, it will come as no surprise that this vigorous propaganda effort was accompanied by the construction of many of the Confederate monuments that have dotted the Southern landscape since, end quote. So one of the arguments that Abraham Lincoln made in those Lincoln-Douglas debates was that Southerners at their core were not actually bad people in the sense that no human beings are born evil and that Southerners, in fact, didn't themselves even truly believe in their own prejudices against black Americans. And Lincoln gave a number of examples in those debates, including punishments that slavers had given each other for the way they treated piracy of slaves versus the piracy of material objects. He thought that if they were to simply embrace reality, Confederates on their own would abandon slavery and prejudice. And this wasn't a new argument, the moral argument. The writer of the U.S. Constitution himself called slavery a practice that was against all the laws of nature. He said so along with many other moral leaders in the colonies and all over the world, as we discussed in the pilot episode of this podcast. Abraham Lincoln had not been a strict abolitionist like Charles Sumner or Frederick Douglass. His views on what to do about slavery evolved. As the former president of the Organization of American Historians, Eric Foner describes, Lincoln says he always thought slavery ought to be abolished, quote, but he doesn't really know how to do it. He's not an abolitionist who criticizes Southerners. Before the Emancipation Proclamation, quote, Lincoln does not really see black people as an intrinsic part of American society. They're kind of an alien group who have been uprooted from their own society and unjustly brought across the ocean. Send them back to Africa, Lincoln says. And this was not an unusual position at this time. End quote on Foner. In today's terms, Abraham Lincoln would have been considered a moderate. And moderates back then talked about all kinds of things that sound preposterous today. Better working conditions for slaves. Paying reparations to slavers for the loss of income after abolition, gradual abolition, and so forth. Strict abolitionists, on the other hand, eventually they got through to Lincoln. And when Lincoln evolved too far, when he introduced voting rights, he was assassinated by a Confederate, deep in the throes of what we would now call the politics of resentment. And those politics extend throughout Anglo-America, throughout white America, from the South to the North on a spectrum. In the aftermath of the Civil War and failed Reconstruction, the technological revolution is accompanied by what we call the Gilded Age, when everything was painted with gold, but underneath the flakes and the flash and the glitter was terrible suffering. The greed and the cruelty of the wealthy class, living off the backs of what can be easily described accurately as wage slavery, brought the entire country into the Great Depression out of which American heroes like Florence Kelly, the daughter of an abolitionist senator, started fighting for the women's right to vote, which she also felt would help lead children off the floors of factories working under horrific conditions. Florence Kelly, in turn, inspired Frances Perkins, who laid the groundwork for the Roosevelt administration to introduce Social Security, the GI Bill, and a whole new set of economic rights and public works programs that created the middle class as we know it today. But 40 years prior, before the Roosevelt administration, before World War II, there was no such thing as a middle class majority. The American dream was created out of that era. Policies that would now be absurdly called communist or socialist or some such nonsense. 
But with all the Roosevelt administration's incredible successes, including defeating the Nazis, breaking up monopolies, and creating a middle class, our society was still segregated. And it's only 20 years later that founding father Martin Luther King finally leads the country into extending voting rights to black America. And we got into that in episode three of American Origin Stories. How in the late 1960s, Dr. King gives us the answer on how to heal from hundreds of years of slavery and racial segregation, which is more accurately described as the ongoing banishment of black Americans and natives from equal participation, equal access to the country's resources. And Dr. King explains that the way to do this is not just through reparations, but by abolishing poverty altogether. And in that episode, we get into the ethics and the data on this. But after the string of assassinations in the 1960s, which include our founding father of freedom, Martin Luther King Jr., the politics of resentment return, starting with Richard Nixon, whose war on drugs and exploding criminal justice system were positioned to devastate an already terrorized black America and has never stopped. The movement to abolish slavery, first called the abolitionist movement, and then the movement to address the aftermath of slavery, first called Reconstruction, then called the Civil Rights Movement, now sometimes called the Black Lives Matter movement, which isn't limited as a concept to a single organization. This is one movement, and it's the largest, single, most defining human rights struggle in the history of America, in our origins and in our present. And white America's reluctance to address this directly, while knowing very well our moral failing, as Lincoln pointed out to the South only 165 years ago, continues to do enormous damage. This failure to address the impact of slavery and a hundred years of forced segregation is the origin of our nation's collective disassociation from reality. As we mentioned at the start of this episode, our cultural segregation still exists along similar geographic lines to the founding of the country between slave states and free states and the sectarian divisions of the Civil War. And this denialism of reality goes deep into our soul. It's what allows us to continue denying the ghastly reality of the illegal invasion of Iraq. We continue to bend over backwards to forgive the so-called moderate position of the political leaders of our era who voted for that invasion, even promoted it. It was as insane and as illegal as the invasion of Ukraine. In a hundred years from now, the justifications for those who promoted and voted for the Iraq war will sound as primitive as Lincoln did when he was considering compensation for slavers or considering sending freed black Americans back to somewhere other than the land and nation whose economy and history they'd built without pay. As Dr. King said, white America overall, in all its diversity, needs a revolution in values. Now, white America might see Dr. King as a hero now, but if we're being truly honest, that's because his teachings are mostly ignored. At the time, whites gave him a 75% disapproval rating. His call for a revolution in values is just as true today. Because as we see, these historical events are not so distant as some might pretend. Poverty still infects black America in disproportionate rates as a result of slavery and forced segregation. Without any comprehensive efforts to repair, poverty infects Native America as a result of colonization without comprehensive efforts to repair. And poverty infects white America at some of the worst rates of any wealthy nation because of the same old politics of resentment from a failure to face and heal the generational traumas of our American family. Now, it's certainly not an impossible endeavor to rectify this. The tragedies of the 1960s in the words of writer Tarzi Batachi, in many ways killed not only some of our nation's greatest leaders, but killed our sense of imagination. The reality is much better than our attitude. We are a very young country whose true history has a long line of ancestors who lived here for many thousands of years, some who came from all four corners of the earth, of every shape and size, who led in faith and form 
against all odds on how to overcome a slaver nation, on how to overcome division, oppression, and corruption. We don't have to wallow in shame about our past. As anyone who is healed from trauma knows, that an honest accounting and atonement with our family can create growth and strength and unity like never before.